As you might be aware, I've spent a lot of time playing EU4. The vast majority of that time has been in single player going for achievements, and lately I've started uploading the time lapses of those achievement runs to YouTube. I've also played a good bit of multiplayer, and although I wouldn't call myself a multiplayer expert, I do think I have a really good understanding of the sort of typical progression of a multiplayer game. The more I've been playing EU4 lately, whether single player or multiplayer, the more I've had this sort of nagging idea at the back of my mind that there was something just not quite right. And it wasn't until I fired up EU3 for the first time in about two years that all the exact problems that I had with EU4 really stood out to me. So what I've compiled here is my personal list of the top 14 things that EU3 does better than EU4. Now a lot of people are going to disagree with me on the specifics, and that's fine. Of course, you're welcome to your opinion, and this is mine. A lot of these things are going to depend on your particular play style, and especially whether you think blobbing is a good thing or a bad thing. And even though I upload time lapses where I've taken over half the world, I'm definitely in the blobbing is a bad thing camp. This list has been sorted from what I consider to be low significance to highly significant and practically game breaking. Also, I'm specifically not going to be taking mods into account because some mods have addressed these very issues. We're talking about vanilla EU3 Divine Wind versus EU4 with all current DLCs, current version 1.19. So, without further ado, let's get started. Number 14. EU3's population system is better than EU4's development system. Every single province in EU3 has a population and population affects things like tax and production income. In general, you want your population to increase as quickly as possible. Unlike EU4, you can't dump MacGuffin points into your random provinces to very quickly double the population. Instead, just like real life, you have to wait, and it takes a long, long time for your population to increase. Things that affect the rate of population increase or decrease are high versus low stability, being at peace, whether or not there's an enemy currently sieging the province, whether the province has been occupied or not, things that would seem to make a difference in real life. In EU4, this whole aspect is just completely gone. Whether you have high or low stability has no practical impact on your development. You can save up your monarch points and over the course of an in-game day, vastly increase the population of a single province. Why this is in the game is beyond me. What's worse, if you've almost fully occupied a country, and this is especially true for multiplayer games, it will have no long-term impact on the country. How ridiculous is it in a multiplayer game when you're fighting someone whose countries should realistically be falling apart, when they're just throwing their diplo points into paying down their war exhaustion, when they're being stab hit out of the war, and instead of leaving the war they're using their admin points to bump their stability just so they can stay in the war that extra month. It's absolutely ridiculous. In EU3, you have an incentive to not be in a constant state of war. In EU4, that incentive is gone, and that's entirely because of the development system. Number 13. EU3's Scorched Earth system is both more useful and more meaningful than EU4's Scorched Earth system. Scorched Earth in EU4 has two purposes. Number one, it increases local defensiveness by 25%. It also modifies the supply limit by minus 50%. So in theory, Scorched Earth is very useful for port provinces that you know are about to be sieged. In practice, I almost never use it, and when I do use it, I'm wondering why I even bother. And the reason why is fairly simple. Decreasing the supply limit doesn't necessarily increase attrition. In general, attrition caps out at 5% regardless of how far over the supply limit you are. So the enemy might be taking 5% attrition, but if they're going to take 5% attrition anyway, then you didn't really help yourself. Especially in multiplayer games, siege stacks tend to be massive, especially on hotly contested forts, because they have to be. You have to have all your troops there ready to move in for that giant imminent battle. That means you're going to be so far over the supply limit that it doesn't matter if you decrease it by 50%. You're already way over the maximum. You're going to be taking the maximum attrition regardless. But because the maximum attrition hasn't increased, it's still only 5%. And yes, attrition does have a big impact on games. But 5% versus 5% is not a difference. In contrast, Scorched Earth in EU3 is very different. First off, Scorched Earth drops the base supply limit by 1. This means that on provinces that already have a low supply limit, the effect of Scorched Earth is going to be that much more pronounced. More importantly, it increases maximum attrition by 10, which means that rather than taking that maximum 5% like a unit normally would, it's instead taking 15% per month. 
You use Scorched Earth on a mountain province, and you can watch the enemy just wither away, just disappear. And that's the main difference. In EU4 with 5% attrition, an enemy unit can easily maintain its maximum strength. In EU3, an enemy unit on a Scorched Province is going to wither away and die. And that's how Scorched Earth is useful. Why is it more meaningful? As I mentioned before, in EU4, with the development system, there are no long-term consequences to doing anything to your country, including Scorched Earth. In EU4, Scorched Earth has four negative modifiers. Local goods produced and taxes will decrease. Autonomy increases by a negligible amount. Institution spread decreases by 50%. These effects last for five years and then they're gone as if nothing had ever happened. Meanwhile, in EU3, Scorched Earth only lasts for 24 months and it also has an effect on taxes, but more significantly, your population is going to plummet while you use it, as it should. You've scorched the earth. Your people are dying. Are they dying in EU3? You bet. You're going to feel those consequences for a long, long time. In EU4, your people don't even care. Number 12. Missions were better in EU3. In EU4, missions fall into what I'm going to call three broad categories. First are the railroaded missions. This is largely country specific and involves a nation doing something that it did in history. An example would be Russia conquering an area, or the Ottomans conquering an area, or Castile conquering an area, or the Reconquista, or forming a PU. Things that are not available to all nations, but are of vital importance to those particular nations that have these specific missions. I don't really have a problem with these missions, but I do wish that they were available to more nations, like if they weren't just completely railroaded, if other nations could get other random missions of this type on, say, surrounding areas so it wasn't completely railroaded. But anyway, that's a minor thing. Those missions I'm generally okay with. Number two are the impossible to complete instant cancel missions. These are things like when you have low prestige and you have little chance of getting prestige and then it wants you to get prestige to complete the mission. You just cancel it. There's no way to finish it. It's impractical. Another one is when you're about to go in debt and you get the accumulate money decision. And my personal favorite throwaway mission, the save up manpower. Because who's going to stay at peace for long enough to save up your manpower to 90%? That's impractical. No one ever does it. Number three is the bread and butter mission for EU4, which is the min-max mission. This is things like increasing opinions just to get those extra 25 diplo points, or colonizing that province that you have no interest in just so you can get that extra settler increase. Turning X province into a city even though you're going to do it anyway just because you get that extra development. These aren't exciting missions by any means. They are things that improve your nation, but they're boring. They don't really change the direction that your nation is going to take. And in this category, you might also include the Conquer X Province mission, because uh, if you're going to conquer it anyway, you just take the mission and then you conquer it, you get a tiny bonus. If you aren't planning to conquer it, you don't take the mission, you do something else. So what I'm getting at is the vast majority of missions in E4 are repetitive, and the mission that you choose largely depends on what you're planning to do anyway. In EU3, that's generally not the case. And I might change my entire game plan depending on what mission is available to me. Now, on rare occasions, I will cancel a mission if it goes completely against my plans. But more often than not, I will do whatever is necessary to complete that mission because the bonuses for doing so are actually worth it. Getting plus one stability through a mission versus, say, waiting two years to get plus one stability naturally? I mean, that is huge. Or how about my personal favorite? The missions that will give you a free core on a nation. And as we'll talk about later, coring and CBs are a bit of a premium in EU3. So getting a free core, a free core, that is huge in EU3. And because of that, the missions themselves are more substantial and feel more important in EU3. And that's the difference. In EU3, when you complete a mission, you can feel pretty good about it and you can see the difference. In EU4, when you complete a mission, 9 times out of 10, don't even notice. Number 11. The uncertainty of EU3 is better than the certainty of EU4. Now this is a nebulous concept that impacts both of these games in a number of ways. It's also a general trend, but it's so pervasive that I wanted to give it its own spot on this list. It's also something where I think a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but again, this is my list, so if you disagree that strongly, you're welcome to make your own list of why everything I've said is wrong. This is also something that's directly related to several other things that appear on this list. And I'm going to try and avoid talking about those specifically because I want to get to those later. 
But let's talk about one thing that doesn't appear separately on this list, and I think it's a really good example. In EU4, for any diplomatic action that requires a yes or no answer, you can see whether the AI will accept or not before you even send the offer. If you see the green check mark, you know they're going to accept. If it's a red X, you know they're not going to. And if you mouse over the check mark or the X, you'll see exactly why. With a bit of patience and experience, you also will figure out very quickly how to manipulate the modifiers to get the AI to respond any way you like in any situation. For example, if you want an alliance with that particular AI, you just increase relations. And if that's not enough to get you the green check mark, oftentimes you can offer a royal marriage. And then once they accept the royal marriage, you'll see that green check mark next to offer alliance as well. In this way, you can chain diplomatic actions. Anyone who's ever tried to vassalize an AI knows exactly what I'm talking about. You can calculate down to the number whether or not they're going to accept or not. And if they're not going to accept, you can see exactly what you need to do in order to bump that modifier from a no to a yes. It also means that anytime you go to war, you know exactly which AIs are going to join on your side and which AIs are going to join on the other side, and you know exactly why. Let's contrast this with EU3. Diplomacy in EU3 has a lot more going on under the hood. When you offer a diplomatic action, possibilities range from very likely to very unlikely, but there's no discrete yes or no. That means that if something is very likely, they might decline anyway. If something is very unlikely, it's possible they might say yes. Can this be frustrating? Absolutely. You're preparing to go to war and you think they're going to join you, it's very likely, and then they decline, and then you're just stuck on your own. I've had that happen, and I'm sure everyone who's played EU3 has had that happen. Or maybe they're very likely to accept the alliance offer. You send the alliance offer and then they decline. And then you look, the next time you're going to send it, it dropped from very likely to likely, and every time you send it, it just keeps declining, right? This is something that's familiar to people who've played EU3. But I would still argue that the uncertainty makes for a more interesting game. If that AI that you thought was going to join you doesn't join you, it means you have to adapt, you have to roll with the punches. How are you going to win that war that appeared to be a curb stomp before you started, now all of a sudden you're the underdog? Can you win it? If you do, it's a lot more rewarding. Or maybe you've got that ally on the other side of Europe, and you thought, they're definitely not going to help me in this war, but you call them in anyway, and then they join. Well great, now you've got that leg up that you didn't think you were going to have. And things like this make the game more interesting. In EU4, whenever I'm interacting with the AI, I feel like I'm interacting with an algorithm. In EU3, when I'm interacting with the AI, I feel like I'm interacting with an intelligence. It might not be a smart intelligence, but at least it's an intelligence. It might not make any sense to you, but if you've ever played with real players, oftentimes things that they do don't make sense either. I can see where some people would prefer the certainty of EU4, and that's especially true for those people who are rooting for Team MinMax. That is, if you know exactly what the AI is going to do in any situation, then you can optimize for that situation. But I'm not on that team. I'm on team let's make the game more interesting and variable. And in that case, I want the fuzzy logic that occurs in EU3, where you don't know exactly what's going to happen, you've got a pretty good idea, you can plan for what might happen, but in the end, you get to deal with whatever the consequences are. Now that's how the certainty versus uncertainty applies to diplomacy, but it also applies to any number of other things that occur in EU3 and EU4. Without getting into too many details, there are a lot of things in EU4 that require a button press using X number of MacGuffin points and then waiting Y amount of time for a progress bar to fill. You can mouse over the progress bar and you know exactly how long it's going to take based on all the modifiers that you currently have. And it's so regular that you can plan for these completions years in advance. You can set your clock by it. Occasionally there are things that might throw your plans off ever so slightly, but realistically this allows for a number of situations that don't make any sense in EU4. And I'm going to get to a lot of these as we go down this list, but I'll just say in general, many of those same game features that require filling a progress bar in EU4 instead rely on random chance in EU3, which means you might get lucky and have something complete right away or it might take you many, many years. The fact is, you simply don't know how long it's going to take. How well you've accounted for the current situation and planned for what's likely to happen next will determine how well you're going to do in EU3. And to me, that's a lot more interesting than the min-maxing encouraged by the complete knowledge the player has in EU4. Number 10, culture conversions made a lot more sense in EU3. This is the first of the certainty versus uncertainty entries on this list. It's also what I consider to be the least important. So why is it on this list at all? In EU3, cultural assimilation occurred randomly, with a mean time to happen of 250 years. Of course, this was modified by a number of factors, including your primary culture, the culture of the province, your stability, which ideas you did or didn't have, 
and position of sliders, population, among other things. In general, cultural assimilation was a very rare thing, and on those very rare occasions where it actually happened, it was something that you would be legitimately happy about. Let's contrast that with EU4. In EU4, culture conversion is something that requires dumping X number of MacGuffin points and waiting for Y amount of time. Now, I've already discussed in point 11 why I think the mean time to happen system is better in general, but the reason why culture conversions deserve a spot of their own is not because of the way that it occurs, but how fast it occurs. As I mentioned, in EU3, culture conversions have a mean time to happen of 250 years, which means in general, you're going to have to hold on to a province for a very, very long time before that culture changes, and that makes sense. What doesn't make sense is EU4 system. If we take the three development province of uh, Suakin as an example, this is not an accepted culture in the Mamluks, and we're going to convert it to Egyptian. This is going to take less than three years to convert. How is that possible? Less than a generation? Really? That is absurd. Now, I understand that it might not be very rewarding to let a slider bar fill for several decades, but the notion that you can culture convert something in less than a generation without literally committing genocide makes no sense at all. This is a three development province, and it's going to take two and a half years. Let's take an extreme example and look at Beijing. Beijing is the capital of Ming China. It starts the game at 33 development, but because of the way culture conversions work, only 30 of that is actually counted toward the culture conversion, so it caps out. So changing the culture to Zheng Hui, Zheng, Zheng Huai, Zheng, Zheng, Zheng Huai, if we spend the 300 Diplo points, which, not accounting for corruption, is the most that you can spend on a culture conversion, and we take a look, it'll take approximately 27 years to complete this conversion. 27 years for the most populous provinces in the game. That's less than one and a half generations. What's worse, you can see the exact date that this culture conversion is going to finish, which, again, is 27 years out, but we know the day that it's going to finish. How does this make any sense at all? Please, someone tell me. Number nine, westernization is better in EU3 than it is in EU4. Now, to be fair, Westernization in both games is lacking in many ways, and also Westernization used to be better in EU4 than in EU3. But I'm comparing the current version of EU4 in which Westernization is a complete joke. In EU3, Westernization can be painful, but more often it just requires a bit of planning. Since you can only move your sliders once every so many years, getting your sliders into position for Westernization is one of your top priorities as anyone who's not Western. Once the hard part is out of the way, the next thing you'll be waiting for is a neighbor who is at least 20 tech levels ahead of you, which means you might be waiting for a very long time. Of course, westernizing will tank your stability, but assuming you have a decently high-powered artist, you can recover your stability relatively quickly. Westernization doesn't have to be very painful, but of course it can be depending on the size of your nation. Westernization can be a four-stage process, depending on which tech group you're starting in. But in general, simply having a bit of knowledge of how the system works will let you be prepared well in advance, and then it's simply a matter of waiting for a high admin leader in order to allow you to press the button and westernize. In EU4, westernization has been gutted and completely replaced by the institution system. Although the game still reports technology groups other than western, in practice, it doesn't really matter what technology group you're in as long as you've embraced all the institutions. It also means that by about 1750, Every single nation in the world has embraced every institution, meaning that the entire world has become westernized. This has rendered protectorates all but obsolete, and the way that MacGuffin points can be dumped into provinces in order to create new institutions out of nothing ensures that in multiplayer, no one is ever behind in technology. This, of course, replaces the old system, which required dumping thousands of MacGuffin points into the abyss in order to appease RN Jesus. All of this, of course, while dealing with greatly increased revolt risk and setting decisions in the corner and not clicking them just to stave off those terrible events for a few months longer. Seriously though, I think the old EU4 westernization system was actually pretty good. At least it was painful and made you work for it a little bit. But for now at least, it's, it's a complete waste of a system. Number 8. EU3 handled religious conversions better than EU4. This is the second of the certainty versus uncertainty entries, 
and it comes in slightly higher than culture conversions because of just how often you have to do this. Not converting the provinces really isn't an option. Even if I take humanist, I still need to have some level of religious unity. So obviously I'm going to get an inquisitor, and I'm going to convert everything as quickly as I can. I'm also going to try and get as many missionaries as quickly as I can. And I'm going to be looking at this tab a lot. Honestly, for the way this works, it seems like this whole process should just be automated. If I could just click a button and have it do it for me, I wouldn't even have this complaint. But, of course, it would still have the certainty versus uncertainty issue, but it wouldn't be anywhere near as obnoxious. In single player, I actually have the game pause every time a conversion finishes, just so I can look back at the screen without wasting any time to start the next one. And playing it this way, which is probably a more efficient way of doing things, makes it feel almost like a mobile game. Wait for the progress bar to fill up just so you can send the next missionary and start a new progress bar. It's not exactly a fun part of the game. In fact, if this whole process were automated, I wouldn't even have this complaint. But one complaint that I would have is that the religious conversions happen way, way too quickly, with or without an inquisitor. In EU4, religious conversions typically take three years or less, and that's without an inquisitor. If you had an inquisitor, now we're talking two years or less, and sometimes even less than a year. Because rebellions can only occur when a faction's progress reaches 100%, it means you can safely convert any number of provinces to your own religion with essentially no risk of rebellion. This of course doesn't take newly conquered provinces into account, but assuming you've already dealt with the initial wave of rebellions, it means you never have to deal with a second wave, even as you're performing three or four simultaneous conversions. Also, since missionary maintenance is so incredibly cheap in EU4, and since every single nation has at least one missionary, means that essentially every nation in the game is going to be converting non-state religion provinces just as quickly as they possibly can. And this even includes the poorest of the one province miners, who, with their very meager incomes, are able to support that single missionary in order to convert their one province to the appropriate religion. Now let's compare this with EU3. In EU3, missionary maintenance is also relatively cheap. However, sending a missionary requires a substantial upfront investment. And especially for poorer nations, this is going to substantially slow down the rate at which they can send missionaries. Also, sending a missionary requires an actual missionary. And depending on the position of your sliders, you might not be getting missionaries as quickly as you could be otherwise. This is especially true for those nations that want to westernize. The more innovative you become, the fewer missionaries you're going to get per year. In fact, depending on the position of your sliders and which national ideas you're taking, it's possible you might not be getting any missionaries at all. That means you'll never be able to convert the lands. Is that necessarily a problem? No, I don't think it is. I think it makes perfect sense. Also, when we look at the conversions themselves, we see that there's no progress bar. Again, we're back to the mean time to happen systems. For any given province, there's a percent chance per year that province will be converted. That's per year. And even for relatively poor provinces, we're talking on average five years or more to convert. And there's no guarantee that you're going to finish that conversion in five years. To me, this makes a lot of sense. In fact, it's very similar to CK2's system of religious conversions. Finally, having an active missionary increases the revolt risk by six. And since there isn't a magical increase autonomy button which will drop the revolt risk by ten anytime you deem it necessary, this means you have to actually worry about revolts. In EU4, on those rare occasions where you have a religious revolt, as long as there's a fort nearby, you don't even have to worry about it, because the rebels have to move to the fort and siege the fort before anything actually happens. That gives you a lot of time to deal with the rebellion, even if you haven't been able to stop the rebellion through other means. In EU3, that's not the case. Rebellions can happen at any time with a percent chance per month, which means you might get lucky and not have a rebellion at all, or you might have a religious rebellion the month after you start performing the conversion. The fact is, this uncertainty means you have to account for the possibility of the rebellion. You can't just leave the province alone knowing that it's safe the way you can in EU4. And it often means that whenever you're performing religious conversions, you're going to have to keep units nearby just in case that rebellion actually fires. And this too makes a lot of sense to me. Unlike in EU4 where you can plan for rebellions months or years in advance, you can stop them entirely by either dumping MacGuffin points or increasing autonomy. And even if there is a rebellion, even if they've occupied land, it's not necessarily a bad thing. In EU3, rebellions are a bad thing, and they should be. In EU4, when you have a province that's going to take over 50 or sometimes even 100 months to complete a conversion, all you have to do is wait for that progress bar to fill up, and you know exactly what month it's going to be finished. In EU3, you're going to think twice about performing conversions on provinces with very low conversion percentage rates. 
If you're not prepared to sit for several decades on a province with a very low conversion percentage in EU3, you're probably not going to convert it. And that makes sense. Creating this video has taken me a lot longer than I initially thought it was going to. And it's also become a longer video than I wanted it to be, so I'm going to be splitting it into two parts here. I'll be continuing soon with my list of the top seven things that EU3 did better than EU4. In creating this list, I've also identified an equivalent number of things that EU4 does better than EU3. So just to be clear, this is not a list to say that EU3 is better than EU4. But as you can see from this video, I think there are a lot of specific game aspects that EU3 handled better. So I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this list is sorted in order of importance. And most of the things on this list so far have been fairly minor. Either minor annoyances or simply things that don't make as much sense to me as they did in EU3. But starting at entry 5 on this top 14 list, we're going to get to those things that I think actually prevent EU4 from being as good of a game as I think it should be. I'm very curious if anyone can guess what they think my number 1 entry is going to be. And please leave your comments because I'm very curious if you agree with this list, if you disagree, and what your thoughts are when you compare EU3 to present day EU4. So thanks for watching and have a good one.